Thank you for joining us here today for the third in our Women of Safarad webinar series. Before we get started, we wish to acknowledge and join Israel in observing today's mourning for 45 people that were crushed to death during last Friday's Lagba Omer festivities, one of Israel's worst civilian disasters. Our hearts and prayers are with the victims and their families. My name is Michael Steinberger, and I am founder and CEO of Jewish Heritage Alliance, a platform dedicated to promoting the story of Sfarad to the world at large. Our alliance brings together global organizations, institutions, and individuals covering the private and public sectors, thereby creating a voice of the collective, allowing us to broaden our scope and expand our reach. For those who may be joining us for the first time or maybe not recall, allow me to define some of the words and terminologies you will hear during these presentations. So the word Sepharad in Hebrew literally means Spain, but in historic context, Sepharad refers to the Jews of the Iberian Peninsula, nowadays Spain and Portugal. As we will be discussing here today, the story of Sepharad is a far-reaching complex story with profound consequences. It is believed that the Jews first arrived in the Iberian Peninsula as early as biblical times, but the earliest archeological proof dates to the fourth century. Jewish life in Spain ends abruptly with the expulsion from Spain in 1492 and five years later from Portugal. This was a challenging period for the Jews living in the Iberian Peninsula, a period I often dubbed the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good resides in the periodic intervals termed the Golden Age, during which times the Jews were accepted in local societies of that particular period, wherein Jewish religious, cultural, and economic life flourished. The bad resides in the repeated periods of oppression and persecution, leading to massacres, forced conversions, inquisition, and expulsion. The forced conversions created the converso phenomenon. In today's discussion, you will hear terms such as conversos, moranos, crypto-Jews, and new Christians, all of which collectively describe the Jews that were converted to Christianity. Moranos and crypto-Jews tend to be synonymous. Both refer to the Jews that were converted to Christianity, but try to hold on to their Jewish traditions in secret. The word morano is deemed to be derogatory, possibly meaning pig or swine, so we try not to use this label or description. A more current term is Bnei Anusim, which in Hebrew means descendants of the coerced. New Christians is what the church called the converted Jews to distinguish them from the old Christians. Converso tends to be the catch-all phrase for all of the above. It is important to note that when discussing converso crypto Jews, we are speaking of their descendants. Today, we are paying homage to the women of Sepharad, celebrating the courage and determination of these women. The dismantling of Jewish institutions by the Inquisition rendered the home as the gatekeeper of Jewish traditions. Risking their lives, it was the women who were taking the lead in preservation of Jewish religion and transmitting Jewish tradition and practices to the next generation. The Inquisition realized that the women presented a serious challenge to the church, trying to maintain their ancestral custom despite the threat of trial and prospect of being burnt alive. Today, we explore the bravery and tenacity of these heroic women and the ways in which they try to hold on to Jewish traditions. At this time, I would like to acknowledge our co-hosting partners and thank them for helping us make these events a success. I would like to acknowledge David Hatchwell, president of Fundación Hispano Judaya or the Hispanic Jewish Foundation. Shulamit Bahat, Chief Representative in North America of Anu Museum of the Jewish People, formerly Beit Fusot. Jason Guberman, Executive Director at the American Sephardi Federation and its Institute of Jewish Experience. Ruth Calvajo, founder of Centro de Estudios Judaicos de Estres de Mondays. Also Avi Tawil, Director of European Jewish Community Center. Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at Museum of Jewish Heritage a living memorial to the Holocaust. Also Avram Gro, Executive Director of Jewish Gen, and Professor Dr. Chaim Shaked, 
Director, Miller Center for Contemporary Judaic Studies, Feldenkrais Program in Judaic Studies, University of Miami. And now I would like to introduce Mr. Isaac Herzog, Chairman of the Jewish Agency, who was kind enough to send us his recorded welcome opening remarks. Dear friends at the Jewish Heritage Alliance, thank you, Mr. Steinberger, and uh, welcome to this webinar. In uh, 1992, my late father, who was then the president of Israel, Chaim Herzog, attended a very historical event in Madrid, together with King Juan Carlos II of Spain, uh, the uh, abolishment of the uh, order to expel the Jews uh, from uh, Spain 500 years earlier was fully implemented and signed together the King of Spain, the President of Israel, amidst the Jewish community of Spain and many other dignitaries in a story that riveted the hearts of Jews all over the world. But the story of the Jews of Sepharad, the expulsion of the Jews of Sepharad in 1492 is still resonating every day until today. And moreover, it has huge impacts on the story of Jews all over the world. Jews who traveled f further to Amsterdam and to Poland and from there all the way down to Palestine. Jews who went to Morocco and since then the implementation of rites and rituals in uh, the Jewish community of Morocco has changed dramatically. Jews who fled to uh, new continents and new worlds, it all had huge impact on the Jewish world and hasn't been studied enough. And not only that, we see many of the descendants of those Jews as Jews who are emerging in new emerging communities all over the world in a fascinating saga which has not been researched and discussed enough. So I think this webinar is outstanding and important in this process that is led by the Alliance is of utmost importance. And I congratulate and commend all of you for dealing with this story. We at the Sochnut, the Jewish Agency, the biggest Jewish organization in the world, which I lead, are dealing day in, day out with this issue, together with the JPPI, Jewish People's Planning Institute, which is part of our family of organizations, to research further and understand more. And we commend you for extending your hand and working so hard in bringing this story way above board so that everybody knows and discusses it. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mr. Herzog, for those kind words. And we do appreciate it. We're now entering the main part of today's program. And we are pleased to offer a very brief video clip produced by ATP, the Portuguese Sport Tourism Association, an affiliate partner of our mobile exhibit called at the crossroad of Sepharad in the footsteps of the crypto Jews created in partnership with the Honor Museum of the Jewish People. We plan to bring the exhibit to life with one of our 2022 educational webinar series. So please look out for it. Please play the video. Thank you, ATP, for this video and your continued support in promoting the story of Safarad. And now, allow me to introduce Dr. Yoel Rappel. 
historian and senior research fellow at Barilan University, also former founder and director of the Eli Wiesel Archive, Boston University. Dr. Appel will share with us one of his recent visits to Portugal, followed by his introduction of Dr. Aliza Lavi, the main presenter today. Aliza Lavi, on one side, she is a very famous one in Israel. But on the other side, she is a very important scholar. She is doing a unique research, and she wrote a unique books. One of them became very popular around the world, Women Prayers. And Aliza, she did a career on academic. She was a senior lecturer at the bar -Ilan University. She was also a member of the par Israeli parliament for six years. And she did a very good job. And she was the head of the special committee for a woman at the Israeli parliament. And she was also a public figure when she was the head of the youth movement in Israel. So you can understand that this unique lady, Aliza Lavi, she grew up in Natania and she did, you know, I can't say it, but every year she is doing a one more step on her, on her career and every year is a new kind of step. You can't imagine what she will do next year because she will find some special steps in order to promote women, Jewish women, and Arabic women, and not Arabic and not Jewish Christians, whatever, in Israel. She is the best in Israel to fight for women in Israel and on also in the Jewish world. And in connecting it, why? The question is, why women kept the Jewish tradition? Why they kept the Sidurim, the prayer books? Why they remember the customs? For all those questions, I hope you will receive an answer from Dr. Aliza Lavi. Hi everyone, I'm so happy and glad to be here and thank you Michael for opening uh, this uh, webinar with a uh, hug to the families. Yeah, we have a bedtime in Israel and I would like also to send my tanchumim to the families that lost their lovers and to say refua shlema to the p'tuim. And uh, this uh, webinar is really um, important uh, to me and I would like to share with you some of my uh, knowledge. I believe in women in the past, in the present and in the future. And as women, we know something about responsibility. And I'm going to speak now about what happened 500 years ago, but it's not a historical lecture. It's opportunity to study, to learn, to understand what can we do with the word responsibility, even though that sometimes everything is changed and everything is not like you thought it will be. Feminine Jewish leadership during the Inquisition I would, like, uh, I would like to speak a little bit uh, about uh, the introduction and the crypto Jews and who sought crypto Jewish women. Women preserved the Jewish light, observance of the crypto Jewish women, Shabbat, Queen Esther, Dona Grazia, crypto Jews around the world, and conclusion. And this was 25 minutes. So like you all said, um, during my journey of exploring women's prayers, I came across the unique stories of the crypto-Jewish women in Spain, 
and in uh, Portugal. My book is a collection of prayers that women wrote during the ages period. Actually, the antique prayer from the 13th century, this book was published in Hebrew, become bestseller, and also was published by Random House. And um, many, many, many women around the world find their voices there because these prayers were written by women that one thing they didn't have, they didn't know how to pray in Hebrew. Everywhere in the world, when you go to the synagogue, the prayer in Hebrew, and when you want to speak with the Creator in the moment that it's so intimate to speak with the Creator with the language that you don't understand, it's very, very tough. So what women do during the periods, 2,000 years out of Israel, what did they do? And who thought about them? Because, you know, Hebrew is not a language that women knew during the last 2,000 years that we were in the diaspora. When we think about men, boys, so at least once for the bar mitzvah, the community, the parents have the responsibility to guide the boy, but not the girls. So who thought about the girls? And more than that, this unique situation 500 years ago, tell us a more. So during my journey, I become familiar with this unique story in our history as Jewish and more than that, as Jewish women. Crypto Jews, this historical chapter in the life of the Jewish people must be studied. As I said before, this is not another chapter in our history book. The story of the crypto Jews is relevant for our lives today in Israel and in the diaspora. Crypto Jews, the Jews living in the Liberian Peninsula who converted or were forced to convert to Christianity during the Middle Ages yet continued to secretly practice Judaism. And actually we are talking about the beginning of the 16th century, end of the 15th century. And this period of uh, time, unfortunately, we call it the lost, uh, um, the lost time because we don't have enough information about exactly what's happened at that time. In the community of the crypto Jews, the status of women stood out. Once there were no Jewish institutions extant, no synagogue, no bet midrash, no public arena for the Jewish life. So the home became the only remaining institution in which one could observe. Since the home was traditionally the women's domain, her central role there became magnif magnified in importance. Consequently, women became active in crypto Judaism as teachers, as well as observers of their religion. So women understood the situation and understood that the home became the stage to tell the story, to educate from mother to daughter, from grandmother to granddaughter, the home is the place, is the stage to tell the story. They were the ones who showed leadership and responsibility for continuation of Jewish existence. They ultimately had to rely upon their memory and upon oral transmission, often tricky. The crypto-Jewish women, the Anusot, took upon themselves a huge risk and many paid for it with their lives. And from testimonies and from a lot of stories, we understood now what's happened that time. In the difficult period of the extinction of Judaism, it is the women who took responsibility for the preservation of the religion and its practice. The Jewish women preserved the Jewish light, the Jewish soul, the Jewish education, and 
the responsibility. They believe in the future and they understood they have to continue, even though all the, and all the, all the platform was changed. So they understood that at home they have tools that they, via these tools, can tell the story. I would like to share with you a small um, evidence that I found in a research of Rina Levin that actually gave her a presentation uh, before. And this uh, piece um, in her article was published in Spanish, in old Spanish. And when I uh, got this information and this piece, I understood that they have a treasure in my hands, but I couldn't understand it. And thank God I met a, a student at Bar-Ilan University, the university that I belong, Yitzchak Hamtovsky, that at that time, I'm talking about 20 years ago, wrote a dissertation at Bar-Ilan University about uh, um, this, the period that time. And Hamtovsky knew and now old Spanish, and more than that, he very, very familiar with our books. And after a month that I gave him this uh, piece, he called me the other day, and I remember it like it was yesterday, uh, because I can cry. And he told me, Elisa, you know what you have in your hands? Actually, you have a testimony that was given to the Inquisition. And that time, the musicians asked the ladies, what do you pray? And which sentences you use? And these ladies quote from Psalms, Tehillim. They knew Tehillim by heart. So from broken sentences from Tehillim for Psalms, they create their testimonies. And close your eyes now now and think about you know songs from Tehillim for Psalms and ask yourself if you know it by heart and these women create on one hand their prayers from broken words and sentences from Tehillim it means that they knew it by heart before and when they were taken to the Inquisition and all the asking and bedtime that they had there, this is a testimony. And I mean, we don't have time now to read all this, but just the few sentences and you can remind and open after Tehillim and see exactly the, uh, is the, the, the chapter there, the song. God, fill my mouth with laughter and my mouth with joy. Fulfill my wishes. Bless me from Zion. Hear, Lord, the prayer of your servant. Let my heart not be proud or my eyes be arrogant. Grant me, my God, that I should understand until a place for God, dwelling places for the mighty one of Jacob and continue and continue. And these testimonies tell us the story, tell us the story of the knowledge, of the understanding, of continuation at home. And as I say before, they pay the price. When we speak about tools at home, we speak about the responsibility of women. For example, Shabbat candles, food, clothes, things that we can do at home to tell that today is different day. Shabbat is not other day. We have six days and Shabbat. So what we do for Shabbat to tell the family, the people that come to visit us, that today is Shabbat is a different day. We have a holiday. We have Neshama Yetera. We have something else to tell the story at home. Flowers, cake, good food, you change clothes, white shirt. So Shabbat and the dietary laws, both of which play a central role in Jewish life. While they are easier to remember 
because they are frequently observed, either weekly or daily, they are also most easily noticed, especially by anyone walking or residing in the household. There were women who observed only a few practice, but they too were suspect and often judged guilty of apo apostasy. So on one hand, they continue, but in the houses where the windows were closed and the door outside different at house, process of education, of telling the story, of trying to build the next generation. Shabbat. Shabbat, the unique mitzvah and the important mitzvah of the woman is to light a candle. Light candle to make the difference between, you know, Sh Shabbat and, and Yom Chol, women. Women are the one, women are the one that tell the family, tell the home the Shabbat is in. Women, you know, women don't have to go uh, to the synagogue and to pray there and say Shabbat is in. We celebrate the Shabbat at home, the women. So below it's beautiful Portuguese Shabbat candle blessing, which was passed orally from mother to daughter and from grandmother to granddaughter. And as you all said uh, before, I also visit Belmonte. And in Belmonte, I met an old woman that was kind enough to give me this, um, I hope you, you can see it, this special candle. Actually, this is a very old candle and it show how the light the candle that time. You know, it's open and they put oil and the, um, the, the, the candle, they made it by themselves. And if someone, you know, disturbed them or suddenly they were afraid, they can close it like this and nothing is, you know, remind a candle. So below uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, candle, they have a special and unique, unique uh, uh, prayers. And in my researches, I collect, as I said before, prayers from women that wrote by themselves or um, say it overly. And this prayer that we are going to read now, there is a remembrance to the familiar wording of the blessing uh, today. And this is very, very um, amazing a prayer that after my book was published, many women in Israel and in abroad uh, add this special unique blessing for Shabbat to their blessing when they um, bless the candle candles every uh, Shabbat. So let's read it. May the pleasance of the Lord and exceedingly holy pleasantness. I pray you, Lord, I knew not how to observe your holy Torah. I don't know how to do it. They took my Judaism, my knowledge, but now that I know, comfort me well throughout my observance of your holy Torah. So may you watch over me and protect me and grant me that which I know not how to ask of you, salvation for my soul and graciousness that I may serve and exalt the God of the heavens. Amen. In this special moment between the woman and Lord and the creator Elohim, I, I forget, I forget, I don't know how to ask. Please, God, help me. In the realm of Shabbat observance, one can find women who lit lamps with clean or new wicks, had their lamps cleaned and replaced the oil with fresh oil. This lamp, as I showed you before, you can see it again, 
these lamps were lit earlier than usual and were not extinguished by either the servants or by their masters. Unlike on other nights of the week, the crypto Jews and Usot also retired earlier on Friday nights. Women wore clean or holiday clothes in honor of this day and best before sundown. To tell the story in the tools that they have at home. Converse would clean their homes or have them cleaned by their servants in honor of the Shabbat and bake challah, even removing and burning a piece of dough as in required by Jewish law. Another mitzvah of women is afrashat challah. I don't have time to explain what it is, but to bake a challah is now become so popular in Israel that Every house, many women, baked a challah for a Shabbat. And that time, women and their families would meet, especially in order to have communal meals. The traditional Shabbat stew was served as the meal for the Shabbat day. Some ate it cold, whereas others left it to a simmer throat the night. So, as I said, tools from the home. No public arena, the private arena. And women took the control and took res- responsibility and the continuation. In my short presentation, I would like to speak a little bit about two amazing uh, women. One, as I know, uh, you're familiar with a um, lecture that was given was given here in this amazing uh, webinar uh, before about uh, Donna Grazia. Donna Grazia was a role model for the Anusot. So about Donna Grazia, I knew and I read, uh, um, but about the connection between the Anusot and Queen Esther surprised me. I didn't know what is the connection. When we speak about Queen Esther, so in Israel, and I'm sure everywhere, everybody, all the girls, uh, my granddaughters, thank God I have uh, four granddaughters and and one grandson. So my granddaughters, all of them want to be a queen, want to be, want to be a, a Queen Esther, uh, at least when they are four or five years, yeah. So Queen Esther, she's a, a queen, a beauty queen. So why Anusot found her as a role model and pray to her? What is all this story? And I found via the testimonies that were taken in the Inquisition, the question, did you fast the fast of Queen Esther? Fast of Queen Esther? Yes, I know that till today, of course, a lot of people are fasting in day before Purim, because of the, the past the, the, that uh, Queen Esther asked Mordechai, but what is the connection between women in Spain and Portugal 500 years ago and Queen Esther? So let's find an answer. The crypto Jewish women consistently risked their life and they were afraid. And the role model that they found was Esther, the queen. The Inquisition frequently interrogated them. For example, the status of Queen Esther, who became a role model among the crypto Jews and Dona Gratia. Previous heroes, Moses and uh, Elia and Shmuel, Eliyahu and Shmuel and Deborah are prophets who are guided and guarded by the divine, but Esther, as I said, operates on instinct, reflecting a mastery of real politics. When Mordechai came to Esther and asked her to go to the king, she told him, go together with the people and fast for three days. 
and I will fast three days together with my girls. And it was a competition between Mordechai and Esther, because Mordechai said, no, we can't fast three days. And Esther told him, go and fast three days. And after that, I will go to the king because I'm not allowed to go to the king if he is not calling me, you know, what is the ramifications? And in the end, all of them, all of the Jewish people fast three days and we know the rest of the story. And the Anusot, the crypto Jews women, so the, 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 the still is role model for them. And many of them fast three days. Many of them fast three days because they thought, they thought that in this way, they can find the redemption. So from testimonies and prayers of crypto Jewish women for whom the figure of Queen Esther served as a role model, we know that they adopted her narrative and hoped that this would be their fate. Esther did not tell her people and her homeland that Mordechai had commanded her not to speak. Queen Esther, who lived exactly 2,000 years before the Inquisition, is associated with hiding her Judaism. The forehire who did her origin and yet reminded faithful to her faith was used in many of the prayers of the crypto Jewish women. Lech knosset kol ha-yudim v'tsumu alai. And many Jewish women fasted as Queen Esther did. And in the Inquisition, they knew about this custom. And that's why they asked the women when they catch them these questions. But all this knowledge, as I said before, we got it after 500 years ago, years because the archive of the Inquisition were closed to researchers and until uh, um, Years ago, that they uh, were open, and not all of them, and it's another story. Donna Gratia Nassi. Donna Gratia Nassi was among the most uh, formidable figures of the Sephardic world in the 16th century. Her dramatic, indeed, the melodramatic life began in Portugal, where she was born into a Jewish family whose members had recently been forcibly baptized. Actually, only in her bat mitzvah, only in her bat mitzvah, she became familiar with the fact that she is Jewish. Again, at house, her mother and grandmother told her that she is belong to an ancient people and they have a different life and they tell her this story. And Donna Gazia became by 1552, Dona Gratia settled in Constantinople. After a long, long, long journey, she ran away from Portuguese to Brussels and then to Venice. And in Ferrara in Italy, she became uh, um, in, in public again, Jewish thing to the Duke of uh, Parera. It's a long, long, long story how she did it and what's happened. But she was the most rich woman that time. And again, we spoke about, remember, responsibility. She remembered her brothers and sister. And when she came to Constantinople and she were allowed to uh, open synagogues and Bet Midrash and help her brothers and sister, she did it. Where she became the center of the world life, helped to converse and Jews in suffering and we know what's happened in Ancona, in the port there with the uh, Jewish uh, uh, people in the port. No, unfortunately, I don't have time. But she took responsibility and she understood that she is the one that can help her brothers and sister. She built synagogues. She established she vote and libraries and books again in Ladino, in other languages and supported scholars and students of uh, the Torah. She helped to result 
hundreds of converses to enable them to return to their Jewish faith. And more than that, she went to the Sultan and got a permission to build Tiberia again. And in the 16th century, many years before Herzl, she was the one to get, that got the permission to build Tiberia uh, and try to bring back uh, uh, Jewish people to Israel. Unfortunately, she died very early and uh, this dream was cut. So some of the crypto Jews continue to keep their Judaism a secret and to cultivate unique customs that had been preserved for generations. Crypto Jewish communities have sprung up in Toledo, Majorca, and other cities in Spain, among, among others. In the cities of Regency, Miranda, and Chavez, as Joel mentioned, in Portugal. And in the town of Belmonte, where a community was discovered that had returned to its 20th century Judaism, like Isaac Heitzer uh, uh, mentioned, and a lot of uh, testimonies and researchers that went to Belmonte and tell the story. I would like uh, to end, and I don't know how much time I have, Michael, but I would like to end with an amazing book that I found that was written by Shmuel Schwartz in, in 1917. Shmuel Schwartz was a Jewish engineer from Poland uh, that uh, heard that there is a work for engineering in Portugal. And he came, he was, um, you know, uh, in these days, uh, we say that, um, you know, Judaism for him that time wasn't something important. And uh, he promised his mother, you know, to continue pray. But when he came to Portuguese, he didn't, you know, uh, pay a lot of attention about his Judaism. But day after day, he heard that there is a special communities in the mountains that all ladies um, are praying in a special way. And uh, he was very curious about the stories. And in his diary and the book that he published, he wrote there about the long, long process till he get uh, to the mountains and how he met the women there and how they, you know, uh, um, understood that he doesn't want to uh, disturb them and to uh, and only want to meet them and to tell them that he's also uh, Jewish. And he wrote all the, uh, the, the long journey that he had. But one piece I would like to share with you, because when they, you know, ask him, who are you? And he told them, I'm Jewish. I grew up in Poland. I'm engineering. I ta -tam, ta -tam, ta -tam. They didn't believe him. They didn't believe that Jewish, you know, are in other places. They thought that they're the only one that survived. And the old lady, after, you know, he came and she agreed to open the door, et cetera, et cetera, the, own, the old lady asked him, tell us one sentence that we will believe that you are Jewish. And he said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloheinu Hashem Echad. And that moment, all the women there put their hand on their eyes. And that time, as they say, the old lady told him, we know that you are Jewish. So read Shmuel Schwartz's book. It's an amazing book that tell how he met that time the old ladies, the crypto Jews, the Anusot in the mountains. I was surprised to find the dead women, especially the older ones who know all the prayers and who also read them in public, actually conducted religious life and rituals. And this is the testimonies from 1917. So, I, as you can hear in the map, and we don't have time, we can find uh, um, testimonies and uh, Jewish life via these uh, amazing uh, women in different places in the uh, in 
you can see it here in uh, Majorca, in Belmonte, in other places. And let's go to the conclusion because unfortunately my time is... So what can we learn from these women for our lives today? Through the lens of the Inquisition's own records, this talk focused on the crypto jewish women demonstrating their central role in the perpetuation of crypto-Jewish society in the absence of traditional Jewish institutions led by men. This talk showed how many conversers act with great courage and commitment to perpetuate their religious heritage, seeing themselves as true daughters of Israel in leadership and responsibility. I attempted to shed new light on the roles of women in the transmission of Jewish traditions and cultures. And I suggest you, and that's what I suggest myself and my daughters and my colleagues here in Israel. We have to become familiar with our history as Jewish women. We have a lot of experience from the ages, from our mothers and their mothers. And we have, we must become familiar with our history because sometimes, you know, we have questions and we have problems. And to solve them, we need to bring back from the past our mothers to get an answer to our days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aliza. Thank you. Thank you for the amazing presentation uh, and your dedication to Sefarad's story and the women of Sefarad. Uh, we are running a little late, folks, but we have our final speaker, and I think it's worth uh, waiting for her. So now I would like to introduce Dr. Ines Nuguero, a visiting researcher at the Institute for Research and Innovation in Health located in Porto, Portugal who will share with us some breakthrough studies regarding Sephardi crypto-Jewish genetics. Take it away, Ines. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. I'm gonna share my, my screen. Uh, so uh, before I start, I would also uh, would like to send my uh, respect and condolences to, to all uh, the families and those who lost their lives in this uh, last Friday. Um, so uh, my title, and because we're running out of time, uh, I'm going to try to to speak uh, a little bit faster. Uh, the title is Genetics, a Sephardic Phoenix. So I will start with an historical contextualization of my work, a little bit of genetics, and then I will show some of the results um, we have so far, and then present and future work. So I would like to start my presentation with these two pictures. Um, they say a picture is worth uh, a thousand words. And, and for me, this is a, a, a perfect example. What you see here is two signatures of exactly the same person. Uh, the first one before he entered the Inquisitional Court and the second one um, after he was uh, tortured and inter interrogated by the Inquisition. Uh, his name was uh, Luis Nunes Ribeiro. He was a new Christian, 30 years old, uh, and he was arrested um, on charges of Judaism. So, um, because people like him and many others like him who were, um, because of this intolerance and these persecutions, that took place for, for hundreds uh, of years. Um, and also because of the resistance uh, in, in, keeping, in keeping the, the, um, the, the awareness of this Jewish ancestry, all this uh, inspired me to study uh, the Portuguese uh, Jewish history in the perspective of a population geneticist, since I am a, a biologist. So uh, when we talk about uh, Sephardi, we usually include Spain and Portugal, but I'm gonna focus uh, only in Portugal because it has a quite different uh, historical background. 
Uh, and when we talk about Judaism uh, in Portugal, here it's full of uh, paradoxes and duality of, of identities between Christians and between uh, Jewish identity. For instance, those words converso, new Christian, anosim, marano, or crypto Jews are often uh, used as uh, synonymous, but actually they can represent different uh, identities and also attitudes towards uh, Judaism. While the first two ones uh, represent those who were eventually integrated in, in the general population, uh, the last three are those who kept uh, Judaizing. Uh, anyway, all of them all always kept this awareness of their Jewish roots, of their Jewish uh, ancestry. Uh, in 1496, the Portuguese king, Dom Manuel I, uh, signed the Portuguese decree of expulsion, just four years after the one in Spain. And a year after that, uh, around uh, 20,000 Jews who were preparing themselves to leave the country uh, were forcedly baptized. Uh, and so officially, this was uh, a way that Don Manuel um, found to, to, to justify to the queen and king, uh, Catholic kings in, in Spain, that officially there were no more Jews in Portugal since they were all baptized. Obviously, this created uh, um, uh, this duality of identities and the crypto Jewish uh, phenomenon. Uh, in 1536, the Inquisition was established um, in Portugal and it reached uh, a peak in 1599 uh, in the northeast of Portugal, uh, which is uh, the place I am from. Um, here in this map, you can see uh, the number of new Christians uh, tried by the Inquisition during the 16th to the 18th centuries. And for instance, here, uh, where I'm from in Braganza, as you see, more than a thousand people were accused uh, in the courts of the Inquisition. Uh, actually, the first time an Inquisitor uh, came here to, in the Northeast, uh, I'm talking about this little uh, left corner here in, in Portugal, uh, he actually writes that this is a land to burn because of the exceptional number of Jewish families um, living, living around. Uh, in, uh, in the 15th century, there were about uh, 100,000 Jewish people in, spread all over the country, which would be more or less 10% of the total Portuguese population. And in the 17th century, they were, the Jewish population was reduced to more or less 10,000. And by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, they were reduced to the centers of uh, crypto Jewish uh, centers, which is the northeast of Portugal and also the area of Belmont. So uh, the Inquisition was, and, and also the distinction between all the new Christians was extinguished in, eight, in 1821. And so after that, we assist to the resurgence of the Jewish communities. First, the, the one in Porto, uh, you can see here the synagogue in Porto. And then thanks to the work of Captain uh, Barros Vasto, uh, the Israeli community was also founded here in Braganza in 1927. But after a, a few years uh, after that, the community was dissolved and basically the families just uh, spread all over the region. And um, so here is a picture of Braganza with a castle. It had, uh, in, the, in the 13th, 14th century, it actually had a synagogue inside the walls, which was not very common. Uh, this is a house in one of the villages I went to collect samples uh, that was used um, as a synagogue. And so being aware of all this uh, historical uh, background, and at the same time, uh, this this, um, this awareness of Jewish ancestry, uh, I wanted to explore how this could be reflected uh, into genetics. And so that's what uh, I did. So uh, as well as the historians go to archives, 
uh, as a population geneticist, uh, my, my archives are the people, uh, the descendants uh, of, the, of these Jews. And why? Because inside each one of us, we have thousands of cells with chromosomes. Each one of these chromosomes uh, is made up molecules of DNA. And this DNA is written uh, with that four letters, A, G, C, and T. So basically, all our uh, instructions, let's say, it's, it could be a book like this, sequences of those four letters. We can study, we can do different approach. For instance, uh, if we study the Y chromosome, we will define the male lineages since the Y chromosome is only passed on from father to son. The mitochondrial DNA will uh, tran is transmitted from the mother, both to sons and daughters, but only the daughters will pass it on to the, to the offspring. So basically, there are also another kind of genetic markers, the autosomes, but for this work now, I'm gonna just focus on these male and female lineages. Then uh, we can go back generations, thousands of years back, and this, just as well as we can construct uh, a family tree, uh, a genealogy, we can do this exactly the same with genetics. And so, for instance, someone that has a particular set of mutations will be um, classified, let's say, as belonging to a particular Y chromosome lineage. Exactly the same happens for the female uh, lineages. So these lineages have a, have a pattern of a worldwide distribution, both for males and for females. And this can allow, uh, this allows us to, to define, first of all, the origin of these lineages and also the, um, the migration routes of these uh, lineages. So we can go back uh, in history. So we published uh, our first results. And what we found for the male lineage, for instance, is that they have uh, high frequencies of particular lineages when compared to the non-Jewish uh, general population. Uh, when we studied the genetic distances, we also found that the male uh, lineages, the, um, they clustered together with other Jewish groups rather than with uh, other non-Jewish, either Europeans or the general Portuguese population. For the female lineages, we found uh, 11 different lineages, and among these 11 different lineages, we select five of them who are, uh, which are um, putative uh, Sephardic founding lineages, since uh, they are basically only, uh, we could only find uh, these lineages among the Jewish descendants of the Northeast of Portugal. So when we compare our samples in a very easy way with, with what's uh, up in the global uh, databases, we found that they always either cluster together with themselves or they share, for instance, uh, the same branch as the Belmont Jews, as the Belmont uh, maternal lineages, meaning that they do have a common uh, ancestry. For another lineage, again, the same, either they cluster together uh, or they share uh, the same ancestry with, for instance, a sample from, from Spain, which uh, is right on the other side of the border, Zamora, it's a small town, and also with a very um, uh, rich Jewish past, let's say. Uh, this is very interesting, for instance, this lineage here, T to E, uh, our Jewish samples clustered together with both Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews spread all over. For instance, in Poland, Czech Republic, the Netherlands, Turkey, the USA, um, spread in different places. And the last lineage, uh, again, uh, they share a common ancestry only with another sample from uh, Ashkenazi Jew uh, from Moldavia. So, in conclusion, this means that 
uh, we detected an ancestral genetic heritage, uh, both for males and female lineages, that can reflect uh, their origin in the Middle East. Uh, we also detect very high levels of genetic diversity. This, this means that this, these communities here were funded by several different individuals. Um, also, we found some evidence of a mixture with, uh, with the non-Jewish populations, Portuguese non-Jewish population, and also we found that they have there's a greater genetic affinity between these populations and other Jewish populations or individuals, both Sephardic or Ashkenazi, than to the general uh, Portuguese population. So this is what we found so far. Uh, in, in 2018, I started a new project uh, with Professor Carl Skorecki from the Varilan uh, University. And what we want to do is to define accurately an, Iber an Iberian Jewish reference population uh, because there is no such a database. And this would allow uh, for other people, for instance, if they know that they do have Iberian ancestry, they could check their, their own DNA with our database. Um, so I started to collect samples in, uh, in all around Portugal and also some small places in Spain uh, where they have a, um, a well-documented Jewish past. And so basically these this DNA samples uh, represent uh, what, were, what once was the flourishing Sephardic Iberian community. And, and so they represent a unique resource and opportunity to fill in a gap in global Jewish population genetics uh, studies. Right now, the, this project is in, uh, I already collected the samples, and right now we are looking for uh, the funds to continue our research. So if any one of you is aware of any foundation that we can apply, I will be very grateful. Here are my contacts. If you have any question or um, any suggestion you, you might want to do, please do so. And thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'll give it, I'll send it back to you, Michael. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Ines. Thank you. Wow. What an eye-opening presentation. Amazing job. I think you got all of our attention. And we will do uh, more webinars and, and go a little deeper into this whole subject. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Ines. We really appreciate it. Thank In closing, because we are running out of time or ran out of time, I'd like to point out that the Sfara the segment of Jewish history does not have the same coverage or attention as European or biblical Jewry. So I invite each and every one of you to learn more about this silent but rich and profound segment of Jewish heritage. Please join us on our upcoming webinars. Follow us online. Thank you everyone for making this event a success. We'll see you next time. Thank you.